use the half angle formula. Yeah, you end up using half angle formula. Uh, or the double angle formula, actually. Cosine of two theta. Anyone happen to remember that one? <laughs> I'll give you that one. Cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. So, what's the trig identity? Probably bad wording. What's the relationship between sine and cosine? Cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. So therefore, cos and so cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. Sine squared is equal to one minus cosine squared. If I plug that into here, that negative gets distributed, and so we end up with cosine of two theta is equal to two cosine squared theta minus one. I thought you were almost onto it. You... <laughs> I was thinking you were almost onto it, just, just, just a little bit. Uh, so, so we need to solve for cosine squared. So cosine squared theta is equal to one, bring that over one plus cosine two theta times one half. So that's the substitution we'll make, and this becomes a much simpler integral to do. So we have the integral of one half d theta plus the integral of cosine of two theta d theta for the numerator. I, I got this one. Cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and we never got out of the loop. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the integral of cosine? Yeah, take that time. All right. So we got a negative sine. Cancel out. Yeah, we need to do something with that two there. So divide by two. Because when we take the derivative, we'll get. It's positive, isn't it? Cosine. Derivative, yeah, the derivative of sine derivative is positive. Derivative of sine is positive, so that should be positive. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so anyway, it's not going to change the answer even if we had made that, that mistake. So um, this will end up being pi plus. Did you factor out the one half from both of those equations from that earlier? Oh, one yeah, there should be a one half here, which would make this a one fourth. Yeah. Because the derivative of sine is cosine, and then we have that extra two using the chain rule, which cancels out. So it cancels out partly with that, leaving us the one half. Uh, no, one half. I don't think it matters all too much. No, it doesn't. Because what is this? Zero. Okay. So what we end up with here is the average value is the square root of pi over two pi, or the square root of one half, or square root of two over two, or one over the square root of two, whichever really feels like the one you like. Depends on how brainwashed you've been by the math people. Partly. And so the RMS value is just the amplitude divided by square root of 2. In this case, our amplitude is 1. If our amplitude were something else, we just stick that be in front, we just multiply by it. So if I have some function a cosine of omega t plus theta, or let's make it phi out of tradition. So I have some function with respect to time of this. The average value or the RMS value would be the amplitude divided by square root of two. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
So I will now risk my life for your personal entertainment. I've done this enough. So I have this multimeter. All of you are familiar with it. I'm going to stick these into the applet here. And it is jumping all over the place. Why would it be jumping all over the place? Because you have an alternating current. Yep. So I put it on DC. It is now assuming that it's going to be alternating. Matter of fact, it assumes it's going to be alternating. I think it's 60 hertz. We can actually test that elsewhere. But if I put it in here, and it reads 125.5. Four, somewhere in there. 125.4 volts. Now this is only gonna give me one number here, but I have two potential numbers that it could be involved. It could be the amplitude that it's telling me, or it could be the RMS value. Anyone happen to know which one it tells us? Anyone wanna take a, a guess? Amplitude. Or? RMS. There we go. <laughs> I do appreciate your going for it, though. <laughs> it, it gives you what's considered an average value, which is actually a root mean square average. So therefore, what the amplitude is, this is equal to the amplitude of our voltage divided by the square root of 2. And so the amplitude ends up being that times square root of 2, 169. I'm going off memory on that one. I got 177. 177? Okay. Maybe 169 is if it's 120. And so we can put into that form voltage in our applets here. So voltage as a function of time is equal to. 177 volts times the cosine of omega t plus phi. Well, let's work on the next bit. What is the angular frequency of our current? Or if you're not sure of that, what is the frequency in the U.S.? Yeah. What is the frequency of our current or voltage in the U.S.? 30 hertz. Is it 60 hertz? It's 60 hertz. <clears throat> and in Europe? 90. What do you say? 90. I think it's 50. I thought it was 50, yeah. You're looking at it, is it 90 someplace? Yeah, I guess so. I used to get like Japanese stuff and it would be like a switch on the back from 60 to 90 hertz. Somewhere I've got a chart of various things around the world. <laughs> and since I'm not coming to find it quickly, ooh, let's see. Ah, there we go. So Japan, it looks like every place is either 50 or 60. But there are a couple of them that are striped, and I can't quite tell from my picture which ones are supposed to be striped. Probably just stupid and can't read. <laughs> <laughs> I resolution picture next time. All right. So 60 or so, what is the relationship between the frequency and the angular frequency? Relationship between omega and f. Angular frequency is 2 pi times the frequency. So 2 pi times 60, which is 370. Again, going off memory here. Yeah, 377. 377? Yeah. There's the 77. Oh, there's the there too. 
And so we can now flesh this out slightly more. 377 radians per second times time plus phi. And that's pretty much as far as we can go without more information. Phi is the phase shift because, frankly, when you do the lab next week and you are using the lab quest to try to figure out what the equation is for the voltages, phi depends upon when you hit the start button. So we will assume a great deal that phi is zero in a, a number of cases, and if we're off, then the, everything is off by the same amount, so we would just shift it. But that equation describes our voltage coming out of our sockets. Why don't we take a break there? Come back, refresh as daisies, if they are ever fresh, and we'll actually get into the nitty gritty world of analyzing AC circuits. Laser diagrams. Woo! I do feel like it, it is nice to get it all over with. You don't have to worry about it, but at the same time, it's like, oh. A lot of work. <laughs> we'll discuss it at the end. Yeah. <laughs> like two hours before I come into class, I'm like, what have I done for the past two days? <laughs> you know? I feel that way on Mondays. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, because we do have one student absent, just to make it official, that next Tuesday, the homework quiz on chapter 32 and the master set due a week from Thursday. All right. Alternating current. But first off, when working with the DC, I'll say universe, uh, working direct current circuits. We have Ohm's law that we deal with a great deal, and we have Kirchhoff's rules, and those still apply, but you gotta be careful about how you apply them. So when you're talking about instantaneous, instantaneous voltage, current, those are the two big ones right there, Kirchhoff's rules apply. And so that's both of them, that's the, the voltage rule that the sum of voltage gains and losses going around the circuit is equal to zero, and then current flowing in equals the current flowing out of any junction. Ohm's law applies to the, the maximum values. And I put Ohm's law in quotation marks here because we're gonna see several different equations which are not officially Ohm's law, but they move along very parallel to it. And so I'm just gonna lump them all together. Still voltage is equal to current times some sort of resistance equivalence. So Ohm's law applies to, I guess you could say peak values. Some brief vocabulary here. This one's not going to shock you like those. R is for resistance. X is for reactance. And Z is for impedance. It is not pronounced impotence, it's impedance. So we'll start out with a very simple circuit of, I have some AC power supply and I have a resistor. The AC power supply has a maximum voltage of epsilon sub naught. And, well, we can express it by epsilon is equal to epsilon sub naught cosine of omega t. 
plus five, but I'm just going to drop the five for, for now. Let's just assume it starts at a peak value. Or if it doesn't start at a peak value, that plus five just shows up everywhere. Now, the current is floating back and forth, so there's no automatically high side and low side, but I'm just going to assume when it starts out, one of them is a higher voltage than the other one. I'm just going to assume that that's a gain in voltage going across that when we first start. So doing Kirchhoff's rule. So the change in voltage, uh, wow, that word probably worded, the change in potential or the voltage across the power supply plus the voltage across the resistor is equal to zero. Epsilon sub naught cosine omega t plus I r is equal to zero. Oop. Minus I r equals zero. And so we have I r is equal to epsilon sub naught cosine omega t. which is just the voltage across the resistor. Or the current across the resistor is epsilon sub naught, so the maximum voltage, which was 177 volts for our outlet, over the resistance, cosine omega t. There's nothing particularly tricky or hard about this, this piece of it right here. This is the same kind of thing that we were dealing with before. Just conceptually, we have current flowing back and forth as opposed to only one direction. Questions up to here. Who did you say I was? I is the current. Oh. The lowercase i because it is alternating current. Okay. Even though CATS does not use the same notation, but most, tech, most sources that I ever look at use the same notation. Okay. All right, one, I do this to sort of ease people into AC because it can get real complicated real fast, especially, man, that master set question. It was a test question. That was, um, yeah, a fun problem. So imagine that since the current here, it's oscillating back and forth, but we have this cosine bit right here. So imagine that I've got something that's spinning around. I really want to highlight it, make sure it's different than my axes. If I think about the projection onto the horizontal axis, that right there, that projection, is my instantaneous value. Which means that this angle right here, since it started at zero, would be omega t. And if this arrow is spinning around in the traditional counterclockwise direction at an angular speed of omega. So imagine a uh, twister has a dial like that where you have, you have the arrow and you spin it and it goes spinning around. Similar to that, except this will keep going as long as the power is going. So with this arrow is spinning around and the projection onto the horizontal axis or the x-axis if you want, onto the horizontal axis is will tell you the instantaneous value. My voltage has the exact same phase, which in our case is zero here, has the exact same angular frequency. My voltage could be described by some other arrow that's right along with it. Now I have a capital VR there because that is gonna be the maximum voltage because this arrow here is represented by whatever the length that is. So 
but it's the projection onto the horizontal axis, which tells us the instantaneous value of the voltage plus the resistor. So just a way of visualizing is we have these arrows that are spinning around counterclockwise, and the projection onto the one axis, onto the horizontal axis, tells us the instantaneous values. The length tells us the maximum value. And they both have omega t as its angle? Yes. Because, and here's one of the rules, the voltage across the resistor and the current through the resistor are in phase. In phase means that they are completely in sync. If I plotted it, first voltage from the power supply, and so on. So voltage from the power supply. Voltage from the, going across the resistor. And then the current. Now, the relationship between the current and the maximum voltage, or the maximum current, the maximum voltage, we don't know what it is without more information. So as a generically, I'm just, well one, it's a different set of units, so it's got a different scale. But two, I don't know whether to make it bigger or smaller, so I'm gonna just make it smaller. For no particular reason, I made it smaller here, so it seems natural that it would sort of fit with that. And this would be my current. And in this uh, and this circuit right here, and also be the current that's flowing out of the power supply. But the fact that they are in phase is something that will be true regardless of how complex we make it. For the resistor, the current going across it, and the voltage of the resistor are in phase. Which brings me to some vocab words here. These arrows that are spinning around, they are called phasers, with an O there, phasers. 